we're now going to have a presentation on the lives and times of uh, Frederick Lanchester by Paul Henderson and Paul Nolan. Um, I, I, I think uh, while, while this is uh, going on, if everyone can please mute themselves. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, yeah, thanks, Lynn. Okay, so uh, I'm Paul Nolan. Um, I'm a member of the Publishing Society. Um, I also have uh, a part-time position where I work for the Lanchester Interactive Archive project with my colleague Paul Henderson. Okay, uh -huh. so we thought it would be quite fitting because later this month it would have been Fred's birthday. So we thought we'd just give you um, a short presentation really about his life and times uh, and Paul and I will do this uh, together. Good stuff. Yep, I hope you can hear me as well. So we're going to share one of our screens so you can see some slides, um, hopefully. So are you going to do that, Paul, or am I? Um, can you do that? Yep, I will try. I think it needs to be allowed by the host. That's the only thing. So if I could... If the host could just let me share my screen at the moment, I can't share it, which would be, there we go, brilliant, fantastic. Let me just share that and hopefully you should see yeah. uh, So slide, slide one. Okay. There we are. Brilliant. Fantastic. So we don't know what anybody knows about Fred, so hopefully this is going to enlighten you all a little bit more. So at Coventry University, there's the Lanchester Library, which is named after Fred. And on the second floor of the library there, we have our own, um, what would you call it, a micro museum is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, so it actually contains uh, a Lanchester car, as well as a number of sketchbooks, notebooks, and a lot of interactive archive materials as well. But the whole reason why he's um, connected with um, Coventry is down to his uh, automotive industry. But, he, but before we go into that in any more depth, let's just share a few examples of what Fred was known for and for some of his inventions and some of his firsts. Yeah. As I say, we've we've only got a short amount of time, but um, we're going to really only scratch the surface. But if you look at cars, planes today, um, almost certainly you'll see aspects of those um, that uh, Fred either invented, patented, um, had an idea for, wrote down, um, and the list goes on and on and on and on. As I say, we've only got uh, a few minutes this evening. I would say people have got homes to go to, but they're already in the homes, so um, you haven't got far to go. But um, it's just a little flavour, uh, and we're going to concentrate on a few different aspects, some of the automotive aspects, some of these aeronautical things, which you may not know about, and also um, the, the reasons why uh, Fred has such a connection with Coventry. Okay, so the first Lanchester factory uh, moved here in 1931 and produced cars until the 1950s. We also had the Lanchester College of Technology, which opened in 1961 was later called uh, the Lanchester Polytechnic. Of course, we all know it as the Lanch back in the 1970s when it was really popular with the whole kind of music scene and the specials, even the Who played there. And one of the kind of separate projects that we're working on within the archive at the moment as well is that we're looking at putting together um, almost like a history of a lot of the bands and a lot of the music and how the music developed uh, from the Lanch at the time. Uh, the library itself was opened in 2001 and then the interactive space, the small micro museum, if you like, opened just a few years ago. So we'll take you back. We'll, we'll sort of do this chronologically, but we will go, go off on a few um, tangents. But we're going to go back uh, 152 years to 19, 1868. And Fred was born in 1868, October 23rd, 1868. He was born not in Coventry at all. Uh, he was born in Lewisham. And we had a student who was looking around the space uh, and she, she was looking at our timeline um, and she stopped and she looked at the timeline and said, Lewisham. I said, yeah, Lewisham. He said, 
I'm from Lewisham. I said, oh, really? I said, no one's ever comes from Lewisham. And so, but the, the only other famous people I know from Lewisham uh, are the 80s band Bross. So it's Bross and Fred from Lewisham. Um, but it's a pretty good company to be in, I think, with Fred. So he's born in 86. Yeah, and it, his whole family is uh, fascinating. You probably might not be able to see this, but this is um, his in, in any detail unless you've got it on a big screen. But this is his family tree. He was born, he was the son of a, an architect, uh, his, his father, Henry Jones, and his mother, Octavia Ward, who was a, a tutor. And he was one of eight surviving brothers and sisters. And um, we will talk a little bit about a, a few of those brothers and sisters um, in terms of uh, Frank and George, who we work very closely with. But there are um, a whole host of other uh, cast of thousands with the Lanchesters, including um, uh, the Hollywood actress um, Elsa Lanchester. You may know from The Bride of Frankenstein with the big, the big hair, the big uh, zigzag through the hair. And her brother, uh, Waldo Lanchester, who um, had a puppet uh, uh, um, uh, theatre that travelled around, started in Malvern and ended up in um, Stratford. But he did start, and this is a little, just a little uh, note from his school days. Um, he did start, uh, maybe not quite the, the racing start that um, uh, you'd expect from uh, what we call as the Britain's Leonardo da Vinci. And these are just a couple of little notes from his um, uh, autobiographical notes. And he said, I was not known to utter an articulate sound before I was two and three quarter years of age. And then I startled the world locally by blurting out the one word, egg. Now, I've been told by a woman doctor who has charge of the infant welfare clinic that the knowledge of my case has been a great and frequent service to her, having enabled her to pacify mothers who were getting anxious as to their offspring, who were a trifle behind in that same direction. She tells them that one of the greatest, one of our greatest scientific engineers never spoke a word until nearly three years of age. And I suspect she adds that he's made up for it since. So he got a scholarship uh, to the Normal School of Science, which is now um, uh, the Royal, uh, Royal College of Science, part of Imperial College. Um, and he studied physics and chemistry uh, and also was taking evening classes in um, uh, making uh, scientific equipment, more practical things. Um, but he, he left uh, before his final year. So he left without getting any qualifications at all. Now, this was a problem because he had no qualifications and no real money behind him and no job to go to. So he got a job in the local patent office as a draftsman. And this is where he uh, worked hard on his first, uh, probably one of the reasons why he knew the patent system inside, inside out. And his first patent was only when he was 20 years of age, uh, a, a machine to help him uh, draw parallel lines and hatching because he was having to do that over and over and over again. Um, so he had his first patent when he was just 20 years um, old, um, and it was the first of over 200 patents that were accepted um, uh, over his lifetime. Uh, he moved to Birmingham uh, from London to, to start as uh, assistant works manager for what was called the Ford Gas Engine Company. And he was joined by his brother, George, who's sitting there on the right, um, uh, later on uh, to be an apprentice. And in fact, he eventually put George in charge of um, uh, many, uh, about 60 men, uh, even when he was so very young. And George was a fantastic engineer and carried on uh, Fred's work after he'd um, left the company there as well. Um, but his first love really um, was to do with aeronautics. And he, on a, a voyage across to um, America to, um, for the Ford Gas Engine Company, he noticed uh, the flight of the birds flying alongside the boat, uh, the ship. And uh, he noted these down in his notebooks. So here are some of the pages of the notebooks which have been scanned and digitized as part of the, the project. And he noticed the way that they were flying. And he wondered if it was possible to create a, a machine that could fly using um, the similar sort of uh, wing shape. Um, and this is 1892. So this is 11 years before the Wright brothers have flown. So he started on, the, on his return from there, he started to experiment with some gliders. And you can see this was, he was living in um, Alton near Solihull, um, not far from where Birmingham Airport is today. And you can see on this picture, these are one of the gliders. This is actually a powered glider uh, powered by rubber bands. It's got two um, propellers at the back. 
Um, and we've actually got a colorized version of this picture, which really brings it to life. So he'd be, only been sort of 26 in this picture. He's a very dapper young man with a fantastic mustache. Um, and uh, he was testing some of these gliders. Now, you will notice anyone who is interested in planes, this semi this elliptical wing shape here, very reminiscent of uh, a plane that flew in the Second World War, Mitchell's Spitfire. Well, this design of wing is 40 years before Mitchell's ever drawn a Spitfire wing. So he's way ahead of his time in lots of different ways. And Mitchell credited uh, some of his design ideas back to Fred. This is 1894. So this is the street, uh, St. Bernard's Road in Alton. And these are some of his experiments. So not only did he um, come up with some very fundamental theories of aerodynamics, but he was able to test those out. And as you can see, what it must have looked like in 1894 to see these gliders flying across uh, the road, going two or 300 metres um, from his house. Uh, and he was working, uh, he was doing this on the weekends with his brothers. Uh, and so he was branded along with Fred and uh, with, with Frank and George as the unholy trinity because of all the banging crashing they do working on a Sunday. Um, as you can see, it's not all of the plane, not all of the tracks worked and some of them uh, would uh, ended up crashing into trees and things like that. But you can see from his notes uh, some of the testing that he was doing. And again, way ahead of his time. He was interested in stability when he was looking at these um, uh, wings. But also what has eventually come around in the last sort of 10, 20 years is these use of winglets uh, to reduce drag, reduce fuel use um, that we see on almost every plane now. Well, he was experimenting those over 120 years ago, uh, and uh, he's got patents for some of those planes um, all the way back then. So again, way ahead of his time when it comes to um, aerodynamics and aeronautics. Okay, so moving on to 1894-95, what we've got here is uh, a picture of uh, the first all-British four-wheel petrol motor car, which was invented by Fred. And this car actually ended up being in Coventry. But in order for him to test the engine of the, uh, the motor car, um, he couldn't test it fully because uh, there was the speed limits on the roads and you, you didn't have that many motor cars on the roads back then. So he took the engine from the car and he put it into a boat and that's where he could fully test the engine. So the picture that you see here, this is where he's on the River Thames down in Oxfordshire. So it would be fair to say that he, uh, he designed and built the very first British motorboat. Ooh, pretty good. <laughs> he certainly opened it up and let it rip. And more, more recently, we've had uh, a friend of the, uh, the project who's actually built um, a small replica version of that boat and has actually tried it out. So, and it's even got a little model of Fred on it as well. Yes, that's fantastic, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, in 1897, he patented this uh, flying machine. Um, and it's a, uh, on the next slide, I'll show you some more details of it, but this is quite an incredible machine. Now he never got to build this, unfortunately. Um, but it's a flying machine which is streamlined, it has contra-rotating propellers, it's got um, elliptical wings. And a couple of years ago we had a student called Asita Aguazi who uh, was basically tasked with making a flight simulation of this model because Fred didn't get to build it but we can now build it in the simulator and to see whether it would have flown. And uh, once uh, Asita had plugged everything in, you can actually literally sit in the simulator with a joystick and fly it and he said, number one, without a shadow of a doubt, it would have flown. Um, its wing shape is particularly advanced. You can see the rendering on the top right hand corner there. It looks like a modern drone. It could be, it could be built um, by Boeing um, in the last sort of five years. It's incredible. Um, it's uh, would have, uh, the, the wing, the, 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 the profile of the wing had 50% more lift than the Wright Brothers plane. And so if Fred had been able to pursue this and build this in 1897, then that would have been six years before the Wright brothers. And frankly, everyone would have heard of Fred. But of course, back in 1897, if you were trying to build a flying machine, because they weren't the word plane, it was just a flying machine, then um, you were branded as a, a, com a complete madman because there was no infrastructure for doing it. Even though cars were very, very early, at least there was a business 
model for building cars, but there was nothing for building planes. So that one has unfortunately been lost to time, but we do have a, a, a model being built. And so hopefully, eventually, we may even get a full scale model of this. We've got to do some more wind tunnel tests, um, but perhaps even a, a, a full scale model with a pilot who's willing to fly it, uh, which not rather him than me, but it certainly <laughs> would be an exciting thing to see a design from 1897 uh, taking off uh, in 2020. It'd be absolutely um, in incredible. Okay, so this um, card that you see here, um, this is actually on display at the um, Science Museum down in Swindon. And something uh, that you will see every single time you step into your own car, if you have one, is uh, something that's in front of you. Now, if you notice here, so where you've got Fred and George sitting in the car there, you, they've got something that's kind of uh, going on, uh, going over their legs, so over their knees. And, and anybody, any idea what this might be? Well, I can tell you, this is actually an original dashboard. And the reason that it's there is that when the car was actually moving, um, the, all, the, all the dirt and the bits of rubble and stones and stuff would kick up. Um, this was also known as dash. So what it did was it actually gave a bit of protection to the driver of the car at that time. So this here is, is your original dashboard invented by Fred. There we are. It's actually, in, in this model, it's made of uh, leather stretched over a, a metal frame. Um, and uh, he's got a patent for that uh, from 1901 to see exactly um, how that works. So after these prototypes, he formed the first Lanchester Engine Company uh, in 1899 with his brothers. And uh, the first production cars came online. You can see on those original ones from 1895, um, they had what's called tiller steering, but later on, very soon after, we've got the steering wheel that uh, came online. And uh, but some of the original Lancaster owners prefer, prefer tiller steering, so it was an option. You could have tiller steering, or you could have a uh, steering wheel. Um, until the bodywork got much bigger, and um, it made it difficult for the for the tiller steering. And some of those cars are still around today. Um, this car's out over at the um, Jaguar Heritage Daimler Trust over at Gaydon, uh, FRW seven six six, and is still run, still does the London to Brighton run. So fingers crossed, I think it'll be doing it again this year. Um, and that's the very same car on the left-hand side uh, with uh, Frank and George, two of jo uh, Fred's brothers, um, at a, an event for the coronation uh, back in 1952. And the little cartoon at the bottom uh, just says, what England thinks today, Lanchester thought of years ago. And that's one of uh, Fred's own cartoons, uh, modestly speaking about uh, some of his um, achievements. Then in 1903, it was the second ever um, motor show, which was held at the Crystal Palace. And one of the things that Fred wanted to do was to actually show off his 10 horsepower car. So this is his driver, Archie Millership, and just kind of have a look and see what he does here. Quite incredible. So if Top Gear was around in 1903, that would have been your only bit of footage because that's obviously that's when it goes back to. Um, many, many years later, Central Television actually um, filmed the same car going up the steps of Coventry Cathedral. And uh, the problem they had, though, was when it got to the top, um, they couldn't actually turn the car around because <laughs> it was too big. So it's the early 1900s. So um, he then actually, it was, only, it was only in 1907, 1908 that he managed to publish his work on aerodynamics. And then you can see there's a big gap there between when he was actually doing the experiments and when he was able to publish it. And of course, um, this meant he'd kind of missed the boat in terms of uh, making this public um, uh, with the Wright brothers flying in 1903. So, um, but that's because he just didn't get the support um, early on. Um, but we do have, he did go and see the Wright brothers fly 
And we do have a letter from Wilbur Wright discussing their ideas um, as well in the collection. Um, and he got so far with his uh, aeronautical ideas, he designed this monoplane in 1909 after going to a, an air show. And he went to the same air show as somebody else, um, Harry Ferguson, who was the, obviously of uh, Ferguson Tractors uh, fame. Um, and the first, he was the, Harry Ferguson was the first Irishman to build and fly his own plane. You can see a very similar designs of the monoplanes. Um, we've got a, a fantastic bunch of guys down at the men's shed uh, over at the Rose Centre at Spawn End who have been building us a, um, a replica of this plane. It wasn't a very successful plane, it unfortunately crashed on its first and only flight. Um, but we'd love to see we're, we're, that that plane is almost finished um, and it's been a fantastic labour of love to get that um, uh, plane going and, and off the ground. It's just been covered and it's sort of final uh, silk covering now. Uh, but it wasn't just uh, planes, it wasn't just uh, cars, but trains as well. And this fantastic um, hybrid, hybrid prototype, he did a lot of work for Daimler as a consultant, uh, and they asked him to come up with a, uh, an idea for a train car. And this train was um, uh, tested around Coventry um, from the Daimler works, uh, around Rugby, um, Northampton, Leamington, Kenilworth. Um, and it was actually... Uh, his first uh, dabbling with hybrid power uh, and he had a patent in 1910 for um, hybrid power which as you if you read it today in one paragraph it nails what hybrid power is exactly in your Toyota Prius or uh, any car like that uh, taking electrical energy storing it and then turning uh, in a battery and then turning it back into motive power uh, through the motors so uh, and, and this tray this um, uh, was experimented before the uh, first world war and then uh, shortly after the First World War, but the idea was shelved um, later on. But it's a fantastic looking machine. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about hybrid power uh, shortly. This, is, this was another venture that um, Fred got involved with in terms of helping with the war effort. So this here is one of his armoured cars that was used in Belgium. And this was actually helped to rescue pilots that had been down during the Battle of Ypres back in the day and you can actually go to uh, eBay nowadays and you could actually buy your own uh, Lanchester Airfix model or something similar <laughs> and, and, and have a build of that yourself. He married Dorothea in 1919 and she was actually um, the niece of his voice tutor because one of the things that Fred also was very passionate about was uh, singing and music. Okay. However, when Fred did get married, um, his honeymoon was kind of cut short because he was actually honoured an honorary degree of a Doctor of Laws by the University of Birmingham. So, yeah, so he had to, and this came around quite quickly. I think within the space of two days, there were five different pieces of correspondence that were going back and forth between Fred and the university. So, sadly, yeah, he cut his honeymoon short so he could go and receive his, do his doctorate. Oh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, go on, you go ahead. Uh, so um, by the 1920s, uh, Lanchester cars were real competitors for Rolls-Royce. They were either uh, the same price or a little bit more expensive. Um, they would have cost the equivalent of at least £100,000. Um, and the Lanchester 40 horsepower Lanchesters, which uh, were introduced in 1919, so we just had the centenary of the very first um, 40 horsepowers, um, were uh, real luxury cars uh, exported all over the world. Some of the first cars to be available in exporting left-hand drive, but they went to, um, uh, to, to India, to all, all over the world, to some of the richest um, men in the world. Um, and there was also a real royal connection as well, because the Duke of York, who became um, the king, uh, uh, George VI, um, was a real fan of Lanchesters. He'd known Frank for a while and had some private Lanchesters. And so when he was made king, uh, he insisted on having um, Lanchester cars uh, made for him for both private and personal uh, use. And this picture on the left is really, really special because um, here is uh, King George uh, giving a wave. And this picture was actually taken at uh, Tile Hill Station. And this was in 1938 when he was being uh, shown around the shadow factories in 1938. And the person chosen to show him around the factories was in fact Frank Lanchester, uh, uh, Fred's brother. Um, and so the connection was uh, made then and later on they were uh, given a royal warrant. So cars, Lanchester cars were made by royal appointment uh, to King George VI. 
and the royal connection carried on. Uh, this is, uh, you'll see the Queen Mum uh, stepping out of that car and uh, the Queen and uh, Princess Margaret also stepping out of the car, um, which was the, li the limousine version at Lanchester. So her, the very first car that uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, travelled in when she was a baby was a Lanchester. And the car on the right is the car she learned to drive in. Uh, and in fact, she even um, apparently uh, went on honeymoon with Prince Philip on, uh, in, in Lanchester. Um, as long as she was driving and not Prince Philip was driving, I think we'd probably be, uh, uh, prefer that uh, situation. But it wasn't just, as I say, in, uh, the, the richest men in the world were uh, the Maharajas in India. And this is just a one Maharaja's collection of Lanchesters uh, taken out for to be shown off when uh, Frank Lanchester came and uh, came on a tour. And actually the building in the background is a motor house. So each car had its own uh, chauffeur. And each that, that motorhouse in the background was in fact designed by Henry Lanchester, another one of Lanchester's uh, brothers. When it came to the hybrid power, um, uh, this was another fascination of uh, Fred's. And he developed this, this uh, small car here, which you can actually see. Well, you can't see at the moment because the think tank's not open at the moment. But you can see uh, when it hopefully when it reopens. This car is a one-off prototype hybrid car from 1927. Uh, on display in the, in the think tank um, and again it's a, a, a car that was way ahead of its time but this is the mark 7 he kept on refining the design but unfortunately um, it would have been too expensive to produce uh, and uh, the equivalent sort of austin 7s came out they would have been sort of half the price so it was a it was a solution to a problem that wasn't quite there yet but again a petrol electric hybrid car way ahead of its time and we've got lots and lots of sketches of a mark 8 and a mark 9 that are in the collection as well. So now we come to the really interesting part of uh, what is the connection, uh, what's the real connection with Lanchester and coming to Coventry? Um, well, in 1930, uh, the depression was, uh, was uh, taking hold and um, uh, the head of uh, Lanchester Cars was appointed, uh, Frank was appointed um, acting managing director because the the head um, Hamilton Barnsley was very unwell um, and the he was charged with implementing some cost-cutting measures uh, because there was an overdraft of £28,000 although the, the company did have lots and lots of orders for armoured cars and other things coming in but there was a precarious financial situation. Um, a representative of uh, BSA, the big Birmingham Small Arms Group, who owned Daimler and um, other marks as well, uh, came for ostensibly a, 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 um, a, a friendly meeting on the, in October 1930, but was actually probably sizing up the assets of the company because uh, BSA and um, Lanchester say, shared the, the same bank. And it's thought there was pressure being put on by BSA to... Um, uh, be able to take over this bank, if it, take over Lanchester cars, um, if they could get it for a cheap price. And towards the end of uh, 1930, uh, in December, uh, it came to a head where the banks withdrew their um, offer of uh, an overdraft and they were facing um, bankruptcy. Now, over Christmas, uh, the head of uh, the, the group, Hamilton Barnsley, uh, was extremely ill and signed over the papers of the company uh, to um, BSA and then very next day had a heart attack and died. Uh, the company had a, a, a AGM on the 31st of December and shareholders like Fred had to decide the company would either go bankrupt or it would uh, be taken over by BSA and so they decided it would be taken over by BSA and then things moved very quickly um, after that. Um, by the It started to be reported in the newspapers so uh, it was starting to be reported. Uh, interestingly, by uh, in the Birmingham papers, it was all about the factory closing down in Birmingham. And in the Coventry papers, it was all about jobs coming to Coventry. So um, some of the most important, uh, we've got headlines here from the uh, Even Telegraph and um, Birmingham Gazette. And you can see the Birmingham works to close down. Uh, and however, there'll be more work for Coventry. In fact, on the same page as that, I did see there was an article about Coventry City Football Club and they'd made a £628 loss that year. So some things don't change. So, um, 
But the gloss was put on it that you can see with that um, £28,000 uh, overdraft, the BSA group was so much bigger and they were putting the gloss on that it was a, a, they would be joining forces and there would not be a merger at all. Um, but that wasn't quite the case, as we saw later on. George carried on uh, uh, um, to be uh, chief engineer. And so from 90, by the time he got to the middle of January, the factory closed down on the 17th of January in, in Birmingham. And by the 2nd of February, everything had transferred across to Coventry. Uh, but of course, very, very few of the workers had transferred across because Coventry was the other side of the world then. They were, they were, they were never going to move there. So they all got, uh, many of them got made redundant but were given um, generously one week's um, wages. The Lancaster brothers managed to persuade the new owners to give them one week's wages in lieu of, of notice. So going back to the first car, uh, this first car here of 1895, um, this was actually housed at the Daimler factory at, on Sandy Lane. But sadly, it was destroyed on the night of the Blitz on 14th of November, um, 1940. So, the bottom right hand picture there, that shows you where all the high explosive uh, bombs landed back in the day. And then the diagram above gives you an idea of the size of the Daimler factory. So all of the shaded areas that you see here, these were all kind of wiped out due to the fires. And then where all the dots are on the diagram shows you where the, where the bombs landed. And sadly, that's when, the, uh, that's when that car was destroyed. However, George, uh, being brilliant, <laughs> uh, could remember the car in every detail and so made um, a scale model of the car itself, which we now have on display in the space at the library. I was saying earlier that um, Fred also had a, a great passion for singing and music. And one of the things that he uh, explored more deeply was the musical scale and he was able to prove ma mathematically that the musical scale was incorrect and that it was it was actually missing a note and so this is, these are just some of the uh, notes from one of his notebooks which gives um, a little outline of it but there was a whole publication that was um, that was published about it back in 1941 called the musical scale. He did his bit for the second world war um, by digging up the, his tennis court and putting into it an allotment. But of course, he's now uh, becoming a lot older, so he needs a bit more help. So he invented himself a self-steering wheelbarrow to help with all his, to help, to help himself on his allotment. <laughs> okay, sadly, uh, Fred died on the 8th of March following two strokes and uh, his ashes were buried with his parents back in 1946. And he actually died um, very, very poor. His wife had to sell off things like his piano to pay the death duties and things like that. Because although um, he had many, many patents, he, when he worked on one project, he would very much be just looking forward to the next project. He self-published a lot of his work. And so he's, um, although a genius when it came to design and engineering, he was a terrible businessman. And so um, ended up, as I say, having to have his... Uh, um, uh, costs paid off by his mortgage paid off by um, charitable uh, donations in the end the cars carried on but by the end they were effectively just rebadged versions of daimlers and so in 1956 the last uh lanchester cars la badge lanchester cars were uh, rolled off the production line um and uh, eventually daimler decided that they weren't going to have two brands anymore however Obviously, Jag uh, Daimler got taken over by um, Jaguar, and there's a new exhibition coming up at the Motor Museum about that. Um, and Jaguar Land Rover, obviously, still um, uh, are still going strong. Uh, but there is, for whatever reason, Tata, who own Jaguar Land Rover, still have a dormant company, Lanchester Motor Company, on the books. There's 100 pounds in the bank, and they have a AGM every year. Um, so, for whatever reason, they've hung on to the name Lanchester. I mean, some marks like um, Maybach and um, for Mercedes and Lagonda for Aston Martin have come back as um, uh, as new brands. So we never know. We might see uh, Lanchester cars back on the roads. So we're kind of coming to the end of uh, the the story of Fred um, and his inspiration. 
Um, we've got time just to have a little look at some of the examples of, of what is the collection, what, what is the archive. Um, so we have a collection of uh, sketchbooks and notebooks. Uh, these have all been digitized and scanned. So you can look at every single page of these as you go through on the website, much better, uh, much easier to access than how it coming in and looking at them. But they are absolutely fascinating. You can see all the doodles in the corner and he'll jump around from everywhere. So he'll be, you'll have a really detailed picture of a, a piston or a epicyclic gearbox. And then on the next page, there'll be a sketch of a pterodactyl because he was wondering how their wings might work or um, how to hit a golf ball, the perfect angle to hit a golf ball as far as you possibly could. Um, so you can literally spend, spend and lose hours in there as well. We've also got all the collection of uh, notebooks, uh, uh, blueprints and patents. And there's some crazy patents in there from inflatable buildings to pianos that play themselves to um, uh, just uh, as well as many, many things that we see on cars, like turbocharging, four wheel drive, um, power steering, all of those are his patents. You've seen a few of the fantastic photos as well today. Um, and there are um, 1200 photos in there as well, which are actually fantastic. And the correspondence, which is really fascinating as well. So letters, obviously mainly letters that were sent back to Fred uh, because he would have kept those. Uh, like this one from Wilbur Wright. Um, but as I say, really, really fascinating when it comes to um, seeing the, the, the way, and also fascinating to see the way he, um, he had Parkinson's towards the end of his life. And you can actually visibly see the shakiness of his handwriting is deteriorating. And eventually by the end, um, he was dictating his letters to Dorothea so that she could type them up for him. We have a space that is uh, in the second floor of the, car, of the university library. Uh, we're not open at the moment, but we're hoping to open, Boris permitting, um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, but there'll be there'll be some changes, obviously. Um, so we'll be uh, moving. To, it is open to the public, but we will have to have a system for for bookings. But we'll we'll let people know that as soon as possible. And we have a half a lounge to car in there that you can see. But it is an interactive archive, so. Um, we have a fantastic app, augmented reality app, which you can download onto your phone or your tablet um, and point it at some of the images and they literally come to life uh, and they're based on our website. So if you do want to head over to the website and have a look at that later, it really is it's fantastic. It's a free download, plus some games as well, uh, some serious games based on his uh, ideas. We even have a virtual reality version and also our sort of uh, mobile blueprint. But our favorite thing at the moment, our, which we're most excited about, is um, our new car. Well, I say new, we are the third owners of it. Um, this is a Lanchester 1518 from 1932. And it's got a real connection with Coventry because it was designed by George Lanchester, Fred's brother. And it was one of the first ones to be designed and built in Coventry. Um, and we acquired it last November and we've been um, uh, putting it back on the road. Uh, it was originally made uh, for an, a wealthy heiress and, um, uh, and then it was sold to the owners that we bought off. So it's only had three owners from you. It's absolutely fantastic. And I can give you a little tour of the inside because we've got, obviously at the moment, it's a bit difficult to take it out but we've got some 360 degree cameras. So we've um, been able to uh, take some pictures inside and it's the next best thing to actually getting inside it. Um, but it is a fantastic car. We are taking it to Gaiden tomorrow evening for its first trip out to the Gaiden gathering. So we're, we're really looking forward to that, but it's something we want to get out and about as much as possible because it really makes a connection between uh, Lanchester, the city, the university, um, and it's got some fantastic features like that speaking horn. And it's the perfect vehicle for social distancing because it actually has got a glass screen between the front and the back. So he was obviously even thinking ahead uh, to that. <laughs> so we have had it out on the roads. So if you do see us on the, uh, on the ring road, then uh, give us a wave. Uh, it gets up to speed nicely. The, the main thing you have to remember, I've had to learn to drive it. The main thing and you have to remember is that the accelerator and the brake are the opposite way around. So the accelerator is in the middle, the brake is on the right hand side. And uh, it takes a lot of thinking about to get into the car uh, because you do not want to go into the back of um, somebody else. So here are just a few of the comments we've had from our from our visitors. But um, I think that's probably us done. Mm. If there are any questions, please fire away. 
I can stop sharing my screen now if you like. And you can go back in the room. Could you please, uh, hello, uh, John here. Could you please remind me of the name he had uh, when he published his poetry, please? Didn't have yeah. time to write it down. Oh, Paul Netherton Harris. Paul, thank you. Netherton. Yes, he, he, wrote, he wrote poetry, but he had to write it under a pseudonym because people thought that you wouldn't take an engineer seriously if he wrote poetry and vice versa. You wouldn't get an engineer who wrote poetry. So it's, it's something that we talk about, especially when we take this out to schools and things, because um, it's really important to think, well, this guy wasn't just pigeonholed into one thing. He can do absolutely anything. And so it's, 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 um, it's, it's really inspiring to, to sort of tell the kids that, you know, when they're being sort of channeled into sort of choices, especially sort of GCSE time, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Well, you know, be like Fred, you could, you could do absolutely anything. You could, you could write poetry, you can design bit planes, you can do absolutely anything. You don't have to be put in a box. And I think Fred is a, a really good example of that. How did you spell his name, that, that surname? Uh, Netherton, N-E-T-H-E-R-T-O-N. Dash H E R R I S. H E R R I S. Absolutely Paul. fascinating, uh, both Paul Thank and you. Paul. Thanks very much for a, an absolutely gripping uh, presentation. Speaking as a petrol head, but I'm more of the Armstrong Sidley uh, family. <laughs> um, and also, I, I, I do spend my time out in my shed designing and building radio controlled aircraft in the old fashioned style. Um, so, to, to me, that was, I, I'm pleased to see some of your guys knocking up some of those old flivers as well. So that's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. And we would love to uh, come and have a look around uh, COVID yeah. uh, allowing. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, we'd, do, we'd love to uh, arrange visits as and when we can uh, get, back in, get back in the building. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone have any questions? I um, <clears throat> I wondered what um, their relationship was with the people at Daimler, really. Um, I don't know whether Fred himself uh, came over here, but you could imagine Daimler also had a very high-end uh, product as well. Was there a, a little bit of competition in there? I should think the Lanchester people were a little bit sensitive about that, having to come over here when they were picked up by BSA. Yeah, I mean, Fred had done a lot of consultancy for Daimler before they, they took over the company. So he was actually retained as a consultant um, before then. But eventually he was sort of shuffled off to one side. Mm. Um, and again, although they said initially that um, the, 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 they wouldn't be merging, they would keep it separate, everything would be kept separate. Actually, what happened was, uh, even as sort of chief engineer, Fred's brother George was sort of sidelined on the production of that. That first, the the, the Daimler um, staff was certainly sort of take, taking over. Um, uh, sort of designers like P Pomeroy were taking over the, the 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 design of some of those 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 cars. So, I I think it would be fair to say there were some tensions <laughs> um, when it came to sort of the design and, and build once they'd come over to commentary commentary and. I mean, they were, they were the, the staff wing, you know, uh, the Lanchester brothers were incredibly upset about the, the, the way it was, way it was all handled. Um, and so say they, in those days, apparently um, you could just be given one hour's notice and told to, 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 to go away, but he, they managed to negotiate a, a week's wages for their staff because they cared so much for them. So um, uh, it was, um, yeah, it did sort of distressing time, but I'd say they, they carried on through the sort of 1930s and, and, and 40s in terms of some of the cars. And let's say we've only sort of scratched the surface. I mean, there's some really interesting cars later on. There's the, the LD10, which was developed just before the Second World War um, and uh, everything was put on hold. And so it was only produced in 1945. So when it was produced, it's kind of it looks much more old fashioned than some of the other cars that are produced after the war. Um, because it's sort of stuck in time between um, the, 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 the during the war production, but um, yes, it, it, going from those really grand uh, cars of the the 1920s, which were record breakers, they they took a, a car to Brooklands 
and broke 11 world records in it they they took it in, they just took a standard car uh, put a racing body on it um uh, because they weren't really interested in racing but uh, there's a tire manufacturer called Lionel Rapson and he wanted to test his tires at high speed so they stuck a car stuck a, a racing body on it took it around Brooklyn they averaged 100 miles an hour around Brooklyn in 1924 so for me that 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 transformation from a car from 1895 that does does not look like a car to one that will average 100 miles an hour around Brooklyn in less than 30 years that sort of technological i mean really now we're getting into electric cars the sort of the technological advance for combustion engines and uh, to do to do that in 30 years since then combustion engines have improved but the, the dramatic change you get like that i don't think we've seen since then really uh, thanks paul for your um uh tremendous uh, introduction certainly to me about um fred lanchester i didn't realize he was involved in so many things but do you know the circumstances of his move from uh, london working in the patent office to an engineering firm in birmingham um not really the details of it i mean he was um uh, he was certainly sort of i think he was frustrated at the, the patent office and he had he had these engineering skills that he wanted to, to use he specifically while he was attending university um uh gone out of his way to to learn more practical skills and he was it just seems like when you kind of look through the archive that he was just a, a serial problem solver he just apply himself to a problem and try and solve it and then move on to another one and then move on to another one so he just the way his kind of brain seemed to work he was he was um always looking for the the next um challenge so um I don't know how the the the, the opportunity at the Ford Gas Engine Company came up, mm. um, but yeah. while he was a consultant for Daimler, he did he did um, uh, live in above literally above the um, uh, the the workshop in the factory in, in Coventry. So he did live in Coventry for a while uh, before he he well, initially he designed his own house. <laughs> he <initially, laughs> so he initially got his brother, who was an architect, to design his house in Moseley, which has got a, 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 a blue plaque on it. But he wasn't happy with the design, so he designed, he redesigned it himself. So, <laughs> just yeah. eventually, there's, there's so many different stories about the, the you know, the, his, his character. He certainly would have been an interesting, interesting guy to meet and talk to. His his <laughs> career seems to be a bit of a mirror of another great polymath, who started in a patent office and then wound up producing E equals M C squared. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was very clever um, <laughs> when he was with the Ford Gas Engine Company, considering his age. Um, they asked him to actually, uh, part of his contract was that um, the, the engine company wanted him to sign a clause that said that if he came up with any ideas, they would belong to the company and not his own. And he says, well, I'm unlikely to invent anything, am I? You know, I'm, 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 it's unlikely I'm going to think of anything new. And so uh, they actually removed that clause of his contract. He then went on, <laughs> of course was using their facilities to actually design and invent things. <laughs> yeah, he got, he, he invented, I think it was a new, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new components, I think, to do with the the the, the gearbox. And so, uh, it, and he patented it. Uh, and then for every for every time that was used, he got a shilling. So he, he actually, he did make money out of that, that, that deal straight away. So, yeah. Can I just ask you, Paul, you know, they, they put a new entrance to the library you was talking about maybe getting a talking about blue plaques, but did you able to get a plaque on the entrance to ex explain the Lanchester connection? We wanted to, uh, but there was a lot of com there was quite a lot of conversation about uh, what the content of the plaque would be and and how it would need to be done and who endorses it and things like that. So. We actually got lost on that. What, what, what with the new entrance being designed, but but we have we have made one of our own. And when you walk into the space, it's up. <laughs> <laughs> and we've made them into we've made them into round flyers as well. So that's got a bit of information on there about Fred. We have we have been back. talking about the possibility of doing something with uh, projection across from the William Morris mm. building. So we we uh, and that would be interesting to be able to project more than just the plaque as well. So. Where it'd be lovely to be able to do something like that. A lesson learned 
don't ever give the design of a plaque to a university committee. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know that Coventry Society put plaques everywhere. I mean, we oh, could right. do one. We? That might, yeah. We, I mean, I mean, something we can certainly explore it and see what um, what we can come up with. It's just that sometimes. I mean, you mentioned William Morris building. I'm sure a lot of the students, if they was asked why was it called William Morris, they'd think of the pre-Raphaelite sort of group, yeah. not the engineer, you know. Mm. So they get lost, unless you put it in plain English, this yeah. is why it's called this, not, you know, you, know it, 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 you need to lead people by the nose sometimes. Yeah. Oh, but that's worth knowing, Paul. Thank you. Almost, he, he should be on the, the uh, Walk of Fame yes. as well, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Paul and Paul. Uh, yeah, D where, um, where, the radio, where the BBC radio station is, just there. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. Fascinating presentation, thank you very much. I mean, yeah. I've, I've had the luxury of uh, visiting the museum, but and I, I encourage everyone to go there, but wasn't there a link... Of, uh, did you say something about the Wright brothers stealing a bit of his design for the Kitty Hawk for the first flight? Can you expand on that, please? It, um, what we do know is that Fred was very keen to share his ideas and he actually sent them um, copies of his book, uh, them to have a, a look through and then ask for comments. And so mm -hmm. the letter that you see from Wilbur Wright that Paul put into the presentation, that actually says that uh, we're not actually interested in your paper. <laughs> they call it a paper. <laughs> it's actually this full published work. Um, but yeah, but the likelihood is they probably borrowed some of Fred's ideas. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the, they were, uh, one of the things that sets uh, Fred apart from, from the Wright brothers is that um, Fred's fundamental understanding. I mean, he came up with some of the ideas to, to, which nobody else had with, in terms of aerodynamics. And basically the Wright brothers were experimentalists who were a, a, a pair of uh, bicycle makers from Ohio. And I suspect, in, and the way he writes is incredibly dense. I mean, he's, it's, 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 it's hard to wade through some of his work. And I suspect they just didn't understand him. And I'm not surprised because it's hard to understand him. Um, uh, myself, uh, you know, um, I've got an A-level in, in physics and I had to do some of the interpretation and it was way over my head. So it's, I'm not surprised they wrote back to him a bit dismissive because um, I think they just didn't have a clue what he was on about. <laughs> <laughs> great, great stuff. Um, I know it's not Coventry, but... I've just been looking up. His, the, the buildings in Birmingham are still there. The, yeah. oh, the old Armour right. Mills, yes. Yes, by, they are. Yeah. By a complete miracle. Um, they looking quite look quite good. I can share my screen. That's what they look like. So, uh, yeah. Quite interesting. Yes, Armour Mills is, is, is still there. I think it's... Um, we had somebody come into the space and there's a... Is a, a BMW spare parts company in there, so um, uh, uh, yeah, they, we we need to make a trip over there to sort of uh, uh, visit them at some point. But yeah, it's the, the, the those buildings are still there. Obviously, the uh, Daimler factory is not apart from the sort of powerhouse and things isn't isn't there anymore. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's a fascinating history. It's great. It's interesting. Not student flats then. No. No. Okay, uh, we're, 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 we're getting well towards the end of our time. Thanks again to, to uh, both Pauls. Absolutely fascinating and it's certainly going to get me having a look around uh, to find out a little bit more about the guy and some of the stuff he was, uh, he was up to. And I'd love to come and see it when, uh, when this plague allows. Um, our next AGM, uh, the date of our next AGM is on the uh, Monday the